All right, thanks everybody. So you see this, this talk is called Fundraising in Silicon Valley. Um, and the question is, why is that relevant? I mean, maybe it's relevant for some people. But this isn't, this isn't meant to say that all companies should fundraise from Silicon Valley, or even that all organizations should even be companies. Um, this is really focused on saying, OK, we, we know this is Entrepreneurship Day. There's going to be startups here that are probably at some point going to look to raise money from California outside New Zealand. And so how do you do that? Or what are the tips that you might not know on how things work there and things you might overlook that are going to be uh, really damaging if you don't know them? So that's kind of the, the lens. Even for people that will never raise money from Silicon Valley, maybe it's helpful to hear about how Silicon Valley thinks about it, how VCs there think about it. And some of these tips may actually translate into other realms. Um, but before I get into that, I think one topic that was brought up earlier that was really interesting was impact investing. And, uh, and Matthew and I talked about it a little bit. I think one helpful anecdote that I can give would like illustrate how, how Silicon Valley thinks about this topic, or at least how Founders Fund or I think about this. And I think the helpful story is, um, you know, this has been brought up before, SpaceX. And so the backstory of SpaceX. And I think hearing how that happened might be helpful for people to understand why did that turn into like what's now a pretty successful company and hopefully even more successful down the road. So the story of it was Elon had already started um, a couple companies. One was called Zip2, it was in putting content online. The second one was x.com that turned into PayPal. And so he had already gone through um, what we heard about earlier as like a couple of the steps in going from an employee to a manager to an entrepreneur and, and building up a lot of strength in that area. And maybe the next thing for him was going to be philanthropy. And so he felt like from the, you know, the story that maybe a few of you have heard is we're, what happened to the space program? We were going to be interplanetary, you know, in the 50s, 60s, we were working on all this awesome space stuff. It just happened. What happened? And so he figured, well, maybe the public interest in space has just waned too much. What if we put a probe on Mars? And you could have a webcam on that probe, and people could see what it's like to be on Mars. They can imagine being on Mars. Maybe that would be enough to like start the space industry again. And if he had stopped there, he, he would have found, well, there's this tension between making money and getting people back interested in space. And this tension cannot be overcome. And I've just got to do something really philanthropic, and it won't be sustainable because I'm going to spend 20 million, maybe 50 million on this launch. I'll be out of cash, but at least I did something good. And he dug deeper. He, when he looked into putting this mission together, he realized that most of the cost was in these rockets. Um, and they were just astronomically expensive, such that you would never get commercial space. And that you know a space shuttle launch cost a billion dollars per launch on average. And so when that was discovered, the core problem actually turned out to be the cost of space launch, the fact that rockets weren't reusable, the fact that these old companies had been designing them in cost plus contracts. And if we could change all that, maybe we could make space somewhere that we could end up going. And so that was the core insight that he came to, which alleviated that tension between having a huge impact and having a great business. And then he just became laser focused on, let's make this great space launch business that's going to reduce the cost of launch by a factor of 10. And we'll just take over the whole thing. And we're going to have a fantastic, profitable business, as well as getting people back into space. And so to do that, he had a lot of capital. He put in a lot of his own capital. At some point, he decided to raise money. And so the, the reason I'm focusing on this today is because there's a huge number of people here that are focused on awesome things. And maybe at some point, it'll be advantageous for them to be able to raise money. Maybe they don't have to, or maybe they don't choose to. But if that's another tool in the toolbox, then more people doing important things can be having more impact. And so that's kind of the framework here. Hopefully, some of the tips are helpful. So the basic context or lens that, that I think is, is a useful way to think about this is the life cycle of a company and why it's, you know, it's either growing or dying. And so you're going to start at some point on this, and you're going to run the loop. And this is the scaling loop. So at some point, you're starting with something, whether it's just you, some time, some resources, whatever those resources are, financial, talent, whatever. And you're going to invest those. You're going to build something. And that's going to result in something either profits or a milestone or some other people helping you and you get more resources and you run this loop. And if, if you have something very specific that you want to do, um, you would like to be in charge of your own destiny. So you want this loop to be sustainable and you want to be the one who defines, you know, 
how you want to have impact on a space. Um, and so the question is, you know, why do you have to run this loop? Well, it's not really optional. If you just grow your business very slowly or your organization very slowly, it's pretty likely that at some point, someone who's running this loop very aggressively is going to surpass you and they will either become known as the thought leader in the space or they'll own the market. And all of a sudden, all the impact that you could have had and the thing that you want to do in the world may be kind of, uh, it may be jeopardized by, by this much larger organization that's going to start sucking up the resources from your project. So scaling aggressively in some ways is not even an option. It's almost mandatory in today's world. And so uh, one of the critical resources you can go after is financing. And so that's, that's what I'm really going to focus on here. Running the business is a totally separate thing. What you do, what sort of impact you want to have, totally separate topic. Um, and that's, that could be a whole nother talk, but today is just going to be about these resources that all the people here with the specific businesses and organizations that they want to be starting can do that more effectively. So if we th think about fundraising as a process, it's really multi-stage. So you've, you know, you've got to reach investors or whatever the source of your capital is going to be. You've got to tell your story in a convincing way and you've got to then, that's not enough. You've actually got to close the investment. So step one. You want to get in touch with investors. Well, who do you get in touch with? When do you do it? How do you do it? Seems like it would be easy, but it's, it's actually pretty hard for people that aren't already in the network. And so the first lesson is you need to talk to a lot of investors. You need to talk to not like five investors or 10, but maybe like 20 or 50 investors at some point. Um, there's you know famous stories of people that were rejected from raising money 20 times in a row. And on the 21st time, someone gave them a few hundred thousand dollars and they grew it into a huge company. The question is, what do these companies have in, in common here on this, on this page? Uh, the one thing they have in common is that they're the huge anomaly. Even we probably talked to, you know, 100 companies and, and we invest in two or less of the 100 we talked to on average. So you've got to talk to a huge number. And I think that's something people don't fully appreciate. You've just got to keep going until you find the right match. Um, then the question is, when do you actually talk to these people? Do you, do you talk to them when you have an idea? or when the company's profitable, probably neither. It's somewhere in between. But you want to have accomplished something because basically you're asking someone for resources. So their question back to you is going to be, what have you done that proves that you really care about this or that you're really passionate about it or that there's all these risks out there. Which ones have you proven are not real risks? What have you done going back to this, this loop? You had something to start with. What have you done with that? Why should we think that giving you more resources is going to help you do some of these things. And so have something, have some plausible reason why you are now coming for investment, why you think that this is the right time. Um, so then the question is, who do you go to? And in this example, let's say you're Spotify and you're raising a large growth round. You want to go to an investor who's going to get what you're trying to do. And in Spotify's case, um, this, is, this is Sean Parker, uh, who at the time of the investment uh, worked with us at Founders Fund. And in this case, they got in touch and they realized, here's the guy who started Napster. It didn't work, but it was at the very core of the streaming music, the very, the very beginning of the streaming music space. And he understands all our core insights and he can help us in like very important ways beyond capital. So um, in that case, we invest in Spotify. Who would Spotify not have wanted to talk to? Probably uh, Atomico. They were an investor in RDO at that time. And so you also don't want to get in touch with investors, whether it's institutional or angel, who are directly invested in direct competitors. There's really no good that's going to come out of it. They can't invest in you. They're conflicted out. There's no way that it's even going to happen. So by even talking to them and sharing information, you're just, you're just giving away you know, whatever secrets you do have. And, and you're also looking like you have no idea what's going on. So don't do that. Know who's investing in your competition before you start contacting people. Um, and here's, here's a tidbit that a lot of people actually don't know. Um, even once you find the right people and you've actually accomplished something, the time of year matters. So this is kind of, this is an extreme depiction of, of the truth, but it's actually not that far off. Um, so you do not want to be starting to get in touch with VCs or other investors in June, July, August, November, or December. So that gives you very tight windows here. And the, the reason is this kind of circular logic, which I think comes from the early days of venture capital, which I'll explain how it happened. Basically, you have uh, VCs taking off long summer vacations 
and maybe during the entire summer, someone from the VC firm is gone. And so you can't get to consensus about an investment because not everyone's met with them. And so effectively, you know, many of these firms were unable to make good decisions in the summer or any, uh, you know, confirmatory investment decision. And so as a result, um, the good companies who knew what was going on said, well, okay, we're going to make sure we don't raise in the summer because it's harder then. And now the VCs say, well, none of the good companies are raising in the summer, so let's go on vacation. And so it just like, it's a circular thing where now, you know, you just don't want to try and raise in the summer. It's just going to be harder. And same thing goes for November and December. So don't do that. Uh, get in touch with people January, February, March, maybe April. You want to have a couple months to close out the whole process. Get it closed by June. If you're doing a fall raise, uh, aim for September, October. By the time middle of November hits, people are off on Thanksgiving vacation in the U.S., so this is a U.S. specific thing. Um, and as a result, you also want to design your runway and your, your burn rate, basically the amount of capital you have. And when you're going to run out of cash, make sure, basically, I would say probably try and, yeah, make sure that you don't need to raise in one of these periods. Have runway either through that period or, or beyond it. So once you say, okay, well, I want to get in, in touch with this investor, and I know I've done all the right stuff, and it's the right time, they're going to love it, that's still not enough. Uh, the intro you get is going to influence what they think about you. So um, worst case, you know, you're just going to shoot them an email. No one's introduced you. You know, it just maybe goes to some online submission form. Probably no one's going to look at that. And even if they do, their number one question is, why did you just email me when we had this friend in, in common? I mean, everyone's connected in the Valley. It's, it's probably true here as well. And so if we had this intro, the fact that you didn't use it probably means that they think that your company isn't that good because you probably asked them. So don't do that. Otherwise, people are going to think this is, this is not so good. <laughs> the best possible intro is some CEO that's already made that investor money. They're going to say they know what we like. They know how to run a business. They've evaluated this. Uh, they're sending it our way because they think it's good. And for all the things that are in the like above the dotted line category, Get as many of them as you can just simultaneously making intros to these people or saying, hey, I heard that you, that you got introduced through this other person, but just wanted to say, this, this is a great company. You should talk to them. That goes a huge way in, in getting things started with some momentum. So um, now actually getting introduced, how is that actually going to happen? Um, let's say that you even have this, this CEO here that made that VC money before. Best possible intro. Don't let them just cold email you. Don't let them just shoot an email to the investor saying, hey, talk to my buddy, that's bad. Um, that kind of puts them in a, in a defensive position saying, I don't even know who this is, you never checked with me, why are you sending me this? So you want them to basically pre-check the intro and you provide them with a blurb, here's what we're doing in like three sentences. That person who's making the intro will reach out and say, hey, this is a great company, you should talk to them, can I make an intro? They'll obviously say yes. Then the intro comes through. You follow up on the intro email, say we'd love to tell you more about what we're doing, um, when's a good time to meet or talk, or, or whatever it might be. Um, and your goal there is just get a call or a one-on-one -on -one meeting. So now you're in the door. Um, all that just to get to tell your story. And so next step, tell the story. You've got to convince people that this is a good thing to do, uh, to give you money. And I'm not going to get into like all the specifics because each company is going to be so different of what your story needs to be and how it's going to be convincing that it's not even productive to try and explain that here. And I think that's going to be something that each person has to go through in crafting that story. There's a lot of good online resources about how to do that. Um, but the question is, what's it going to be like when you tell your story? And what you want this to be is like just another day at the office. You've fundraised before. Fundraising is a core function of the company. You want to get more resources, so you're used to doing this. It's just another day at the office. So what you're going to do is you're going to look like the people on the right, not the people on the left, uh, at least in Silicon Valley. Maybe you, it's going to be startup formal. You know, you're probably going from this pitch meeting you know, next to like, talk to a customer because this is just another thing. This isn't like the moment of your life. Um, you do this all the time. So business formal, if, I think if you're wearing full you know, three-piece suits or, or formal suits into a pitch in most Silicon Valley VCs, they're they're going to walk past the meeting room or into the meeting room and say, what have I, what have I walked into? These people haven't really done this before. So you've got to, you've got to make it feel kind of natural for everybody. Um, and it might seem crazy that this is, these are all things worth considering, but these are all things worth considering. Um, second thing, so you want it to be a discussion, not, 
not a presentation. I've heard this said uh, time and time again uh, by people during accelerator interviews. Uh, one of the VCs there would always say, let's make this a conversation, not a presentation. Anytime the, the company would start standing up, everyone else is sitting down, it creates some sort of weird power structure. And so you basically all just want to be around the table talking about the company. Uh, the investors hopefully going to have some good ideas for you, whether they invest or not. They're going to have valid questions, um, sometimes invalid questions. And you just want to kind of learn from them, tell them what you're doing, convince them that this is good. It, it shouldn't be a one-sided thing. You don't want it to be a monologue. It needs to be a discussion. Um, beyond this, the question is, what are you actually going to talk about? Like I said, it's very company-specific, but there's going to be three traits that you need to convince your investor of. One, you're doing something worthwhile. This is a real problem. You're really creating some value here with what, with what your solution is. Number two, you're actually going to capture value so they can profit from this. Or even if, even if we're talking in different contexts, not even about profit, but you need to somehow capture the value so you can keep going. So this isn't an, an ongoing thing where you're just going to run out of money. It either You have to capture value in such a way that you can either make more resources or you can convince people to give you more resources and grow that way. Um, and that what you're doing is defensible, that there's not going to be a million people doing this next week, that there's actually a reason for you to exist. Um, so beyond all that, there's now going to be special topics for New Zealand companies because, you know, for most of the spaces that investors are investing in, there's usually a U.S. company that might be doing it or will be doing it down the road. So you've got to convince this U.S. investor that it's a good idea to invest in a New, Ze New Zealand company. Then there's going to be specific topics that are going to come up. One's going to be multi-office strategy. Um, and, and I use the word strategy there, not plan. So it should actually be a real strategy. Um, if the investor's like, what's your, you know, are you going to have an office here? If you have a real strategy that says, no, we do not want to have an office here because of these three reasons, and we're going to stay in New Zealand, and we're going to market the product from there, that's fine. Uh, at the same time, you don't, want to, you, you don't want to say, oh, we're opening an office here because we think U.S. investors will like that. That's not a strategy. That's just something you're doing for someone else. So every aspect of the business needs to fit into the overall strategy. Same thing goes for distribution beyond New Zealand. Um, it might be different if you're trying to market in different markets, whether it's moving into China or U.S., wherever it might be. Even online marketing is going to vary by geography. So the question is, how do you do that? Um, one thing that can sometimes be different in the U.S. Than, than here, from what I've heard, is um, employee equity. So in the U.S., pretty much every startup gives a substantial amount of equity to their employees. Um, from what I can gather, sometimes that's not the case here. So I think both understanding, are all the employees properly incentivized to really care about this company over the long term? That's something that people are, are going to want to know. And then second, how much of the company do the founders have? Did they, did they somehow give away most of it to investors already? That's also a bad sign because you want founders who are very strong and have created a lot of options for themselves um, and have, you know, even on the financing side. And I think that also ties into, you know, as an, as an aside, ownership expectations from New Zealand investors. If you're investing in companies and, and expecting that after a seed round, you're going to own more than half the company, maybe that's terms that you could conceivably get in certain situations, I would argue that that's going to hurt your equity and the value of that money you're putting in in the long term. And you want to basically set things up so it's a long, long term, growable, sustainable business. Um, and don't, don't mess things up from the very beginning. And there's a few ways to do that and figure out how to structure things. And then finally, global t competition. How are you going to handle growing internationally? If you're raising this capital to go do that, that might look different than, than competing in New Zealand. So now you've told your story. What's next? You want to keep some momentum. You're going to leave the meeting with clear next steps. Pretty obvious. Uh, usually the investors will say, hey, we're going to get back in touch with you. Um, I would just ask, what's the sort of time frame that you usually get back in touch with people? When should we expect to hear back from you? Um, otherwise, you can just kind of drag on forever, for, forever with some firms. Um, and if they say, you know, we're not, a, we're not a fit, just move on. If they're not a fit, they're not a fit. If they say that, you don't want to work with them anyway. Um, and keep, keep going until you find the people who are a fit. Um, one other detail on this, don't find another introduction to some other investor at that VC that burns bridges because now one person is now your enemy because you just went around their back after, you know, they might have already talked to everyone in the firm and it makes them look really bad. And now you're not just not a fit for this round, but you're probably not a fit for that firm even at the next growth round. 
Um, and finally, fundraising process. So you want to create competition. So unfortunately, investors are pretty much pretty mimetic of each other. They really copy what each other are doing and the, what, what each other is thinking. It's kind of herd mentality. So if you think, okay, you're going to raise a round, what's the odds that a certain number of investors want to lead you? Well, a lot of the time, nobody does. It's very few that you get one investor who's willing to go totally on their own and say, we're going to lead this. Um, that's kind of our style, but it's not most people's style. And then usually it's like, well, who, who else is investing? How many other investors do you have? Can we have a syndicate? Uh, we want to feel safer by, by being in numbers. And so, you know, the upshot of this is, well, you want to create competition. You don't just want to go with one option. You might have your favorite firm that you want to work with, maybe two firms, but you want to get a bunch of people competing with each other. It keeps everyone honest and it keeps them moving. So let's say they're moving, moving forward. How do you finance this? How do you structure this, this investment? One thing I referred to earlier is, you know, early stage equity rounds can often be very, um, if you structure them the wrong way and set valuation very low, which is sometimes done, the investors end up with a huge chunk of the company and it kind of distorts incentives over the longer term. Um, and so for first round or two, below a couple million dollars, below maybe $3 million, it's pretty flexible, but below some reasonable single digit threshold of millions of dollars, um, in Silicon Valley, a lot of the stuff is just getting done as notes, which is effectively debt that will convert into equity and ownership at the next round. And well, then you say, well, why should I even invest now? Well, that's because usually there's a valuation cap that sets a limit on the conversion price and some discount to the next round. And this is usually a document that the company will put together and distribute to investors with their understanding of what these terms look like. So that's actually an increasingly popular structure in Silicon Valley for early rounds or bridge rounds in between. Um, equity side, usually that's a little bit later stage. Um, it can also happen at the seed round if, if the company wants it. And finally, this is an actual illustrative investment that we made. Um, and the point here is that you can build relationships over time by letting investors in for very small amounts in maybe the current round, and maybe they come back in in big size in the next round. And so this is, this is actually a company we invest in. You can barely see the amount in 2010. And then in 2012, we actually led something that's uh, far off the y-axis here. And by just putting a little bit amount of money into the company, we were able to build that trust that we really liked what they were doing and that it mattered to us. And by building that relationship and kind of working with them in an advisory sort of role, we got to see how awesome they were doing and how much we wanted to keep working with them and made a huge investment. So I think the lesson here is when you're putting together early rounds, think about who you want in the later rounds. Um, how can you shape the current financing to, to build towards that? Um, and this ties into preparing for that next financing. So get global investors before expanding globally. If this is something you're going to do with this money, get those people who have that perspective, at least for part of the financing. Consider industry experts for the same reasons. Um, I'm going to skip to the last one. Build multiple relationships at your VC. So you might have had someone that was your primary point of contact if they did a very small amount early on. Try and meet more people at the firm. Talk to them about what you're doing. So that way, when it's time to raise more money, they all know who you are. You're a known entity. They know how you've done. They know your track record. And they can say, hey, we, like, we all like working with this person. Let's give them some more money so they can keep going. Um, and the final point Every round needs to be an up round. If you ever have a down round um, or a flat round, it can create a lot of distorting incentives where employees start thinking, well, my equity didn't get that much more valuable these past couple of years. Should I be looking for another company? Should I be trying to get more salary? The way that startups really work is by putting everyone kind of on the same boat. If this company works and the equity is worth a lot, um, then we're all going to do quite well. And so you want every round to be a steady up round of valuation so everyone has these sorts of feelings. And you do that by never do a round that's way overvalued. It's better to do one that's like a moderate step up so that next time you can have that step up also as opposed to some weird uh, roller coaster sort of ride. And finally, it's a funnel. You got to get a lot of people interested. You keep lock stepping them towards a term sheet or a note. You know, you keep everyone honest by letting them know there's other people in the process and you push toward a close. Um, and finally, once you've obtained resources, the cycle continues now. It's, go, it's time to go out and do something with it, uh, which is a whole different conversation that's going to be something specific to every company. But 
now that you've got your resources, go, go do what you can with them um, and set yourself up for the next, the next fundraise. All right. Those are, that's it. Thanks, Scott. That was awesome. Really appreciated the level of detail and um, I think a lot of application to other areas as well, like raising philanthropic funding. I saw lots of parallels with some of my personal experiences. So thanks so much for that. So reflections. In New Zealand, don't try in December or January, because we're all on holiday. I've heard, yeah, <laughs> good to know. Um, yeah, you talked about step-ups and um, optimal times to raise, and could you comment more on, on, on how to tune that? Uh, what range of step ups uh, at what timing? Because that, that is something from my own experience. I know that that's like critical to get that right so that you keep momentum going. Yeah, basically when you actually go out to raise. Um, so I think there's a couple of factors at play. So one is you want to, with each new fundraise, you want to have some new milestones that you've actually done, whether that's growing the business to scale more, making a tech breakthrough, opening up in a new market, something that shows there's a step function in what's happened and the business is therefore more valuable. So you wanna wait until you've actually done those. Otherwise you might end up with a flat round. That's not what you want. So you need to get some of these milestones at the same time. You don't wanna to wait too long and say, okay, let's, let's go down to our last week of cash. We'll just have finished this huge milestone. This is gonna be great. Everyone's gonna appreciate it. No, you need to at least have like a few months of runway left, preferably six months of cash at all times. So you have plenty of time to get these financings done. Nobody can hold like your cash out date over your head to like push down harder terms. So you want to have negotiating leverage. So you want both the milestones and some runway left. That usually means raise for something like two years from the day of raising and then raise again in 18 months and, or, or you can even raise more rapidly and just make sure you always have a nice long runway and you're always hitting some of these milestones. So I would say do your next round once you've proven something big uh, and before you're pretty close to running out of cash, if that's helpful. And then in terms of the magnitude of the step up, I think it matters how big was this breakthrough that you've done? Um, how much do you feel like this, this proves the business more? Um, what does that deserve? And then what's coming next? Because you want to make sure that there's still some room to go later. So maybe it's like, maybe it could be like, you know, double in valuation every, every few years or something, sometimes faster, sometimes slower. Hey, Scott. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to the effect and dynamic that exists in Silicon Valley around uh, investor incentive to, you know, hit kind of grand slams these days. I mean, kind of the, the relationship is no longer just 10 to 1 for these large upside companies, but, you know, sometimes 50 to 1 or 100 to 1. And, and how, how can New Zealand think about that? Candice mentioned, you know, kind of niche companies, which may have a, a smaller return profile. But any reflections you have on that dynamic? Yeah, that's a good question. So if you're going to do niche companies and it's going to have a smaller return profile and, you, and that's something that the founders just know is the case, I would say the question is, okay, who will that in investment matter to? It's either someone who's really passionate about that sort of thing or someone who has a smaller fund. And so even if it has a smaller return profile, if it can still return their whole fund and they really believe in this investment, then that moves the needle for them. If it may be could return a couple percent of the fund and they have to do that, you know, dozens of times, it's going to be hard to convince them that that's something that's, that's worth the opportunity cost, that's worth the time, worth their limited bandwidth. So I'd say for smaller opportunities, probably do want to target relatively smaller funds. Um, but again, even, even in general, it's about talking to a lot of people um, and finding the ones who are the right fit and get it. Reflections. Dan. Hey, Scott, I think me and you have talked about this a little bit uh, offline, but I'm still interested in your insights about when companies do come into the Valley to raise maybe the next bigger round or follow-on round. Are you seeing any particular issues around maybe having companies given away too much equity or valuations being slightly unaligned? And I think you were saying there's a few things. Is there anything Kiwi companies can do earlier in their earlier rounds to try and, I guess, negate some of those follow-on effects? Yeah, I think there's probably two main things. And some of this comes down to, I think, 
investors here also need to realize what these effects are and what's going to maximize their investment over the long term. Sometimes it's not trying to take as much value now, but just playing the long game. And so, um, yeah, I think the specific question, often I think uh, valuations here can be a little bit lower than in the U.S., and so that's a fact. Um, I think as more uh, investment competition comes here, which is going to happen as everything gets more and more globalized and connected, then those valuations will become more equal. Um, and so, you know, in the absence of that, the one thing that investors can do and companies can do is say, we want to do a convertible note. It's too early to pick this valuation. We're going to be going into the U.S. Let's do a convertible note, which will let us defer setting your ownership until the next round. And you will still have much better terms than the U.S. investors will get or whoever we raise from next. And it'll be fair and it'll be kind of calibrated off of that. Um, and yeah, if you give away 80% of your company in the first two years, it's going to cause problems. Um, all of a sudden, you've lost control of, of which what direction it goes in, and you don't want to do that. Um, yeah, the question is, should we be pushing here from an entrepreneur side for more convertible notes? I think the answer is absolutely. Um, it's what's done in the Valley. It's founder-friendly, gets things started. It's usually lower cost to get them done. Um, it's just it's kind of better across the board. There's very little reason to do an equity round as as a first very small round. So I'd say I'm I'm put I, I'll push for it. Every startup should push for it. Everyone should just band together and form a cartel and say no one's investing unless we're all convertible notes. That's that's one uh, that's one sort of approach. I'm all for banding together. So <laughs> any any final reflections? Uh, you, I, I, don't, I think you said one to a hundred or whatever companies that you actually sit down with end up getting financed. What are some of the main reasons why you would choose not to invest? Yeah, good question. Um, it's probably, I would estimate that out of a hundred companies we're introduced to, um, probably invest in a few of them, a couple of them. That's a rough guess. Um, it might be more, it might be less. I think the reason why... You know, the question is, why do we not invest in more of them? I think part of it is the point that was brought up, which is, you know, it's not just 10x on your investment in some of these cases, but like 100, 100 times your money back, 1,000 times your money back. And this distribution between companies is like actually really skewed. So a very small percentage of them is going to dominate all the returns, like across the board for a fund. Um, and so like... You know, as an example, most of our returns at Founders Fund are going to be driven by a handful of companies, and we're okay with that. We know that that's the case. But because you know that the whole, your whole business as an investor and your job of investing other people's money responsibly is going to come down to a few good investments, you need to make sure that you're only making those good investments. You can't average your money across all the companies because you'll just do so much worse because of this really skewed kind of exponential distribution. So you've got to pick a very, very small number of them the specific reasons are going to be different in every case. Maybe uh, you, don't, you don't think the market's there. You don't think the team uh, is going to be capable of solving all the problems. You don't think the product concept is right. But it usually falls into an absence of one of these three categories. Either it's not creating value, they don't have a good enough business model for capturing it, um, whether that's an execution or the actual model, or it's just very copyable and you think that it's going to trend towards uh, like a zero, zero operating profit sort of business. As, as it reaches like perfect equilibrium. Cool, final question over here. Hey Scott, um, I'm wondering if you can comment on when you're going into a relationship with an investor, especially at an early stage, how can you tell if they're a person that's gonna be, or the fund is gonna be aligned with your vision down the road? I mean, two, three years down the road when everything's different, how do you know at that stage who's, who to pick? Yeah, good question. Um, I think, yeah, going back to the one slide on who gets it. So if you know that your investor really understands what you're trying to do and, and that there may be market cycles and at the same time, even if there's a market cycle and things are looking bad, we know what things need to get fixed and like how we're going to survive this and why this is still valuable in the long term. So having someone who really believes in the mission, I think, is important. Then the second thing is track record. Um, so I think looking at that investor and seeing over the long term, have they supported their companies in hard times? What percent of their companies succeed versus fail? That's also maybe another indicator of how, how much they're willing to like see them through those tough times. Um, so I think it's, it, a lot of it's like anything is reputation and relationships. So you need to build that relationship with the person. 
and then hear a lot about their reputation and how they are in working with the companies in good times and bad times. Can you just tell us, because I'm pretty sure over the last few days it's come out that you guys, you and Sam, have invested in Notable. Mm -hmm. Do you just want to, I know that's not Founders Fund, but maybe just share uh, why you guys invested? Yeah. And that, uh, what, yeah good it had question. nothing to do with that fish that you caught, right? It was a pretty big fish, but no, it, it actually didn't. Um, no, we met those guys in, in Auckland when we were there, heard about what they were doing, connected with them back in the US. And I think, you know, the short story is we really like them, really like what they're trying to do. Um, feel like online collaboration through a lot of these document types is like a really important thing. With everything moving to cloud, it's only going to get more important. And they actually had a really cool solution for let's solve this first major problem in kind of cloud collaboration, move out from there. Um, and so not only did they have traction, but a great sort of business strategy and, and a way to own this. Um, and they were thinking really creatively and aggressively about how do we scale it? How do we get distribution? How are we going to make enterprise sales, both US and in New Zealand? So kind of everything checked out, and, and we really like like the team. So, you know, I think when, when that's the case, you usually end up investing. Cool. Thanks, Scott. That Thanks. was awesome. Thanks so much.